our series, and it's week two of our Faces of God series. It was pretty cool, wasn't it, last week? Is, are we getting that from Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 10, describing a, vis, a vision of an unusual-looking creature um, that represents and, and reveals to us the nature of God regarding, this is in, in, in Ezekiel 1.10, regarding the form and appearance of their faces. They had the face of a man, each had the face of a lion on the right side and the face of an ox on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. And so, as Pastor Christy took us through last week, we see, um, we see each creature's face. If you jump to that next slide, we, we, we see each creature's face represented there. We've got the lion, we've got the ox, we've got the man, and we've got the eagle. And, and each creature's face is linked to a particular facet of God's nature. The lion obviously being uh, the king, and uh, the ox being the servant, the, the man being the man, which is easy. And, um, and then the eagle being God, representing God and, and, and what it is to be God. And then each of the four Gospels written in the, in the New Testament um, address a particular facet of God's nature as well. So, so Matthew was the lion, Mark is the servant, Luke is the man, and, and John is God. Uh, or the eagle, sorry. And, um, and so... This New Testament passage, a scripture that Pastor Chrissy just read before and read last week, um, was it, it, in, in this one passage of scripture in Philippians, it actually reveals all of the faces of God mentioned together and the nature of God mentioned together. Let's jump to that in Philippians chapter 2. It says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, the eagle, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant or a servant, the ox, and coming in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, the man. It's the most unexciting one, isn't it? But it's, it's yeah, it's, praise the Lord. But it's still, it's the man, the man. Like, you know, anyway, it's fine. He, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, lifted him right up, made him the king of all and given him the name which is above every other name. So um, so that there is just a, in the New Testament, it really is just a, a lot of a confirmation that, that he is all those things. He is all those creatures. He is all those natures all at once. Last week, we were really blessed. We had Pastor Chrissy and Pastor Lee share about the lion, this, this nature of God that is the line. If you scan the code on your seat, I put a link there so that you can listen, go to our YouTube channel and you'll be able to listen to both messages. And why is that important? Because I, I really believe in this series that God is revealing to us and to, as individuals how much He wants to be known, how much He wants to be seen. And, um, and he, 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 really, he really doesn't want us to waste this opportunity to go deeper with Him and to know him better. So don't waste it. Let's honor the word. Let's grab those messages. Let's listen to them during the week and let's really get on board and let's see God for who he really is. Let's see God for the divine natures that he has that are represented, especially in this um, in these four faces. But this week, Moses and I get to share about the ox, which is great, the ox. Um, and let's pray. Do you want to pray? I reckon we pray. Thank you, Father, that you want to be known. Thank you, God, that you are, you are not a God that is in hiding, but you're a God that wants to be known by us, your creation. I thank you that you love us so much and you want us, you want us desperately to see you right and to see you properly and to see you the way you really are. And so to, as we go through this whole series and this morning as well, Father, open our spiritual eyes to see and know you better. And by the end of this, I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be completely changed because we've seen yet another wonderful side of how beautiful you really are. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. 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 So, so the ox, the ox, the ox identity is, is themed through the gospel of Mark. And, and when it comes to Jesus' agenda, he made it really clear. He made no secret of his purpose. He said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The ox, the servant. 
this is Jesus' words here. He's saying, I didn't show up here to be served, although extremely entitled to be served. But in Philippians chapter 2, we see he laid aside his privilege and he said, I'm not here to be served, but I'm actually here to serve. What, of, what, like of all the religions on earth, you tell me the, the God that serves. It, 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 it's, it's crazy. He came to serve, which was actually really difficult for the people and authorities of the day to fathom and respect. They actually expected the promised Messiah to come with great power and lay waste to all the enemies. But Jesus came saying, hey, I'm here to serve the Father's will. And what's that? It's going to be to serve you. Like, what a crazy thing. I'm here to serve mankind. So it was a little disappointing for the authorities and the people of the day. They were expecting someone to show up in great power and just to make and massacre their enemies. And then Jesus came and said, I'm actually just here to serve. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help out. Very underwhelming for them. So why the ox? Why the ox? Well, like the lion, the ox is powerful, right? But it is far more gentle. It is, I'm not saying oxes are, you know, I'm sure they, they can get a bit wild, but put it next to a lion, I know which one I'm going to try and pat, right? I'm gonna, <laughs> it's because the ox is more gentle in nature. It's just straight out fact. You can pat a lion if you want. Um, the ox's strength was, was used in some countries in historically, but also still in some countries it's used today in acts of service towards mankind. Like to, sim- to simplify, its strength allows it to carry heavy loads that people simply can't carry and its strength allows it to perform tasks that people are too weak to perform, such as like having to plough an entire field. And although Jesus is almighty God, Jesus chose to come as an ordinary man but he never shied away from using and demonstrating his divine authority and power when the opportunity arose. We, we see him heal and we see him deliver all through the Gospels. Jesus, the ox, is revealed, the servant, is revealed in Mark's Gospel as a strong but also humble servant. Jesus, you know, he was never afraid to say it how it was. He was never afraid to stand up and be counted. And, and when it came to solving problems, he solved them like a boss, right? He, 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 he solved them like a boss with great power, but he was always humble. He was never proud. And the author of, of the, the Gospel of Mark, Mark, he wrote to a Roman audience. He was writing to Romans. He wanted Romans to read and learn about who Jesus was. And, and the Roman audience was much less concerned with um, with prophecy and, and things like that. They weren't, they weren't interested in that. What really got them excited was power. Romans loved power. They were an empire that understood power. Um, you see that in Matthew chapter 8. There was a Roman centurion. We know this story. There was a Roman centurion and, and he understood power and authority. And, and when, he, when he saw Jesus and he needed Jesus to do something, Jesus said, oh, I'll, yeah, okay, we'll go. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you don't have to go there, Jesus. I've got a problem. I need you to fix it. But I understand power. I understand authority. I'm a centurion. I'd say to my soldiers, go here. They go. I said, get back here. They come back. He goes, Jesus, I know you've got power and authority. You just say it. You just say it and it'll be fine. Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this. But the Roman centurion, he understood power. The Roman Empire understood how power worked. They understood what authority was. And, um, and, and he understood Jesus had that ultimate power to just simply speak and a miracle would take place. You know, things like Jesus' confrontation with demonic forces, delivering the guy in the graveyard that had uh, 10,000 demons in him, um, confrontations with human authorities uh, such as Pharisees and chief priests would have carried much greater significance to a Roman because there was a power struggle. There was a power struggle and, and, and Jesus was that ultimate power that prevailed. So that's what Mark was doing. He was engaging a Roman audience that understood power. Mark was using the gospel that he wrote to reach the Roman audience and show them that 
God's power works in perfect harmony with humility. And that was a different thing. See, that was, he was taking the Romans a step further. He got them in with the power, but then he said, hey, there's a step further with this because Jesus did all this with humility. So this is the ox. This is, this is the, 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 the perfect blend of power and humility. A servant. This is what the ox represents. In Proverbs 14, the ox in Scripture, a few quick ones. Proverbs 14.4 says, Much increase is by the strength of the ox. It's the back end of a scripture, and you can read the whole thing for yourself, but it's, it's a pretty clear statement. It's a true statement. Much increase is by the strength of the ox. An ox in your life and its strength in your life will bring not increase, but much increase, right? The early, the, like the, in, in early ancient Israel, the ox was the single most valuable animal you could own. In fact, God had forbidden Israel to go to Egypt and buy horses. They weren't allowed to do it. So the ox was the animal used to plow a field or turn a mill or to do much of the heavy work that had to be done. It was actually vital. The ox was vital for societal progress. Throughout Scripture, it talks about, you know, rules about ox. To steal a man's ox was, was stealing his ability to live It was his most valuable possession. If you took his ox, you were pretty much, you know, condemning him to a a terrible life. That ox was so valuable to him. The first mention of an ox in the Bible is kind of interesting. It's in Genesis, and God's actually punishing someone for being cruel to an ox, right? Which, Which speaks about the value of an ox. In fact, speaking of Jesus, who is, you know, the servant of all, and the the ox that we're represented here, it's actually, if you think about that, it's kind of an interesting picture or like a foreshadowing of how mankind's sin was, was called, it caused the cruel death of innocent Jesus. In the same way this ox was being injured unjustly, um, Jesus came and was injured unjustly and killed. Uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting little, because it's the first mention of it in the Bible. The second mention is in Exodus, and it's um, God telling Moses the Ten Commandments. And, and the Tenth Commandment is, you shall not cover your neighbor's, covet your neighbor's house or envy your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So the Tenth Commandment, that the Hebrew people are warned about the sin of coveting, right? And after dealing with house wife, which is a strange order, but let's just accept it. Um, <laughs> let's just accept it. Um, and, and then the servants, after dealing with all them, the first animal that's mentioned is the ox. It's the first animal. There's a few animals, and then there's prop, uh, like other possessions, but the ox is the first sort of material possession that isn't human life that's actually mentioned. So it's up there, right? Um, in fact, like, Oxen and caring for oxen is mentioned all throughout the law that God gives. There's many clear guidelines where that, that, that we were given about the treatment and care of an ox. Why? Because an ox was a life-changing asset. If you had an ox working for you, right, you had a better future than people without one. In the same way, anyone who has Jesus working in their life has a much better eternity and life to look forward to than those without him. So there you have it. The ox. Life-changing. Powerful. Helpful. Strong. Gentle. And through the lens of Mark's gospel, there's a message to Rome about what power can look like when it's driven by pure and sacrificial love. Mark's mixing it. He's teaching them, hey, there's a step beyond power, and it's using power in love. And that's what Jesus did. So back to that first scripture again that, that, that I mentioned from the Gospel of Mark, that, that it says, even the Son of Man, Jesus says, even the Son of Man, me, didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life 
as a ransom for many. Stand alone sounds amazing, right? Doesn't it? It's a great scripture. But, but it's actually the tag. This is actually Jesus going, it's, he's done a teaching. And he's basically, this is him saying, so in conclusion, you know, and this is what he says. But there's events that precede that. And I'd love to have a look at those. So let's, uh, let's jump into Mark 10, 35 to 45. So then James and John, son of Zebedee, came to him and they, and they said, Teacher, we need a favour. It says, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Teacher, we need a favour. So they know him. Like, Jesus, we know each other. You know me, right, don't you? This is, you know, this is, it's, it's me, James. This is John. And we need a favour. Have, have you got a second? Just come over here. And, Je- and Jesus says, cause he, it is, it's very much pulled him aside. And, and, and he, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? The ox, the servant. And he asked, he asked them that. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other on your left in glory. When we're in eternity, is it cool, Jesus, if you, wherever you sit, we'd like to put one chair on one side, one chair on another, and just be sitting next to you. Would when we're in eternity, this kingdom you're talking about, you promised, would it be possible if, if you sat in the middle and one of us sat on one side and one of us sat on another? Jesus, we've got a favour to ask you. Would it be possible if you could do that for us? And Jesus said to him, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. He, and he asked them this, he says, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink or be baptised with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with, referring to his future suffering. He's saying, can you drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? Can you be fully immersed in the pain and suffering? Could you be fully immersed in the pain and suffering that I'm about to be immersed in as I die and pay the price for all of mankind's sins and redeem all of mankind? And they answered, they must have really wanted these seats, eh? They go, we can! Two words, we can! Imagine someone said that to you, man, hey, I've got a deal for you, I've got something really good if you would like it, but I need you to drink a cup of suffering and be fully immersed in a whole heap of suffering. Um, Did you want the thing? Are you able to do that and I'll give you the prize? No one's going, we can. (laughs) Sorry, these guys are going, we can, we can. They answered, Jesus said to them, you will actually drink that cup of suffering, you will be baptised in the baptism that I've been baptised with. But to sit at my right hand, to sit at my left hand, it, th- these places, that these places, can't, I can't grant this to you. These places have been granted and will be, they've been prepared for someone else. So, fair enough, conversations had. And then the other ten heard about it. Yeah. <laughs> then the other ten heard about it. And they became indignant. With James and John. What do these guys think they're doing? Pulling Jesus aside and trying to get a better seat than us in heaven. Oh, this is unbelievable. And they're even making big empty promises. They're going to suffer as much as Jesus. This is unbelievable. We are indignant, right? And so, and, and, and so verse 42, Jesus goes, all right, there's trouble in the camp. And he called them together in verse 42. And he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, the Romans. So the Gentile nation, they've got an oppressor, they've got someone that lords their power over them and exercises authority over them, and they're the Romans. And then he says this this one line, not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, instead, rather than lording it over them, won't be like that for us. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the greatest must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So that's his conclusion. But that was all the bit before. And it makes a lot more sense. It was pretty clear before, but now it's really quite, it's super clear. It's crystal clear. So Jesus is addressing and laying it out real clear for his disciples here so there's no confusion that when it comes to power and authority and how we use it, 
We won't do it the way the Romans do it. Not so with you. Not so with you. It will be different for you. And what he's, he, what he's saying here, this is what he's really saying. We are going to be different. And, and then he explains just how different power, authority, and status will, will work in his kingdom. And so he says this comment, he, talks, he, talk, he makes the differentiation between great and greatest. He says, if you want to be great, you need to be a servant. And if you want to be the greatest, you need to be a slave. And you sort of get the impression, right, that option one might be achievable. I can serve. I could be a servant. Maybe I'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. Sounds, this sounds achievable. The entry-level option looks achievable, but let's have a look at it. It's the, word, the, the word servant is this word diakonos, diakonos, diakonos. It's something like that. It means under rower, under rower. It's a, it's a person that is chained to the floor of a boat, in the hull of a boat, and forced to row. So when, when Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to be like these guys. Chained to the hull of the boat. And at your station, rowing, no matter the personal cost. I wonder if I'll come on. It's not really selling greatness, is he? These are the words. They, they, when he said, when he said to them, if you want to be great, become a servant. They knew he didn't say servant like a butler. When they said, when he said become a servant, he meant this. That's what he meant. It's such a picture of the ox that was often chained to the mill and forced to walk around and around and around, grinding and making the equipment work. Around and around and around. Ladies and gentlemen, option one, great. <laughs> now, if chained slavery to the will of God um, is the entry-level option for greatness, I'm almost scared to see what the top tier looks like, <laughs> right? But it's, uh, the next one is, if you want to be the greatest, you've got to be a slave, and that word is doulos, doulos. This ain't standard slavery. This is not standard slavery. It's a very different kind of slavery, very much a heart thing as well. It's a slave that's been freed. That's, hey, you've done your time. You can imagine someone going down into the, the bottom of the boat and, and going, hey, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry's there. He's like skin and bone and he's just, you know, he's been rowing. He's, this looks terrible. His hands are almost fused to the oar. Jerry. Yeah, mate. Undoes the chain, takes him off, puts the chain down, undoes his leg irons, drops him. You're free. And Jerry goes, no, you know what? I love my master. And I just want to keep serving. So chain me back up out of free will. I want to keep doing this. That's what a doulos is. This is Jesus. This is a picture of Jesus. Jesus was completely free. Pastor Chrissy read it at the start. I read it just before. He was completely free. He was, he was in heaven. He was God in, Almighty in heaven, but he willingly laid aside every privilege he had, and he came down, and he became, he became a man on earth, and, and, and he became, out of great love, out of great love, he submitted to the Father's plan to save us all from the slavery of sin, and, and, and I think that Jesus was preparing him, um, or preparing them, all of them, because he knew that, that he was going to be the greatest. <laughs> it says it there in Philippians chapter 2. 
Um, no one's ever going to lay down as much as him or carry as much as him. And he was just preparing those disciples and making them aware, hey, you know, these great positions you're hoping to have, they're reserved for me. They're mine. See, he's the ox. He's the powerful and humble servant of all. And I want to be clear that God, when Jesus calls us to ministry and calls it, when he said to be great, to be, the, to be great or the greatest, that he was talking about being, um, being the, the under rower or being the, the doulos, the, the slave that returned. He doesn't want to torture you, right? It's not his desire to chain you. No one panic. There's not boats outside. We're not chaining you up so you can live a Christian life and, you know, fulfill that, that call on your life. But what he's saying is that the, 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 f- the cost to really follow is just high. Like it's crazy high and it hurts and it will take more than you get back and it will feel hard sometimes and it, will, and it doesn't mean he doesn't love you and it doesn't mean he won't be there to comfort you, but, but it's a war, mate. He, Jesus is here waging war in the heavenlies trying to save a lost, a lost mankind that is broken and hurting and completely lost and, and completely enslaved and it is going to take sacrifice from us. That's what Jesus is saying. There is sacrifice. And when you think, and what he's saying is just when you think you've sacrificed a lot, there's probably going to be more sacrifice. And it's not because he's trying to afflict you. He's going to comfort you through the whole thing and help you through the whole thing and resource you through the whole thing. But it might feel like that sometimes. It might feel difficult. He's the ox though. He is the powerful, humble servant of all. He's the greatest because he's the greater servant. If you're grateful for the ox, just give him some praise right now. If you're grateful for him, if you're grateful for his suffering, just just tell him you're grateful. He's the servant. He came to serve. Ephesians chapter uh, 2. Mankind are described as sinners who are lost... um, and, and at the mercy of Satan because of the sin in their life. And God's, God's um, word describes uh, mankind as deserving of the consequences of their sin. But in verse 4, we see something really encouraging and extremely relieving. It says that even though we were sinners, it says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We may not be next to Him, but we're up there sitting down right? And he sent his son, the ox, the servant, to save us. And because of what Jesus did, it made it possible for God to raise us up in verse 6. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches and of his grace expressed in kindness in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, so no one can boast. So ver- chapter si- verse 6 there says, And God raised us up. Okay, if, can you put 6 up? Is that there? God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms. He served us. He raised us up and he seated us in heavenly realms. So, so, so my observation here is, if he did the raising and the seating, it says that he did it, that means that we were actually the ones that were carried and placed. It's true, isn't it? If he was the one, it says God raised us up and seated us. So that's all his work. That sounds like all his effort. That sounds like all his energy. He's the one that raised us up and seated us. That means that we 100%, we, we, we must reconcile with the truth that we have been carried and placed. Carried and placed. Like the ox, Jesus carried the weight of our sin and allowed God to carry us and place us in a beautiful new level of status with him. If you're grateful for the ox, make some noise. So Paul wrote, 
to, a, to the church in Corinth and he shared a bit about eternity and some other things. And, but he finishes up a little, little thing here and he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, three things remain, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is? The greatest of these is? What's the greatest? Love. love. The greatest of these is love. The greatest thing that will always exist is the sacrificial love of God for us. Do you find that comforting? There's so many things that exist. There's so many things out there that exist that we like, we enjoy, but there'll be three things that will always exist, faith, hope, and love, but God makes it really clear. The great, Paul made it clear. The greatest of these is the sacrificial love of God. So keep that in mind as we, as we um, look at an event that took place while Jesus was having his last meal on earth before he died in John chapter 13. It was the Passover celebration, and, um, and Jesus knew, this is in John 13, 1, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he would leave the, this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. He now showed them the full extent of his what? Of his what? Of his what? Now, just tell me this, answer me this. What's the greatest thing? And what's he about to show them the full extent of? His love. I I hope this gets your attention because this excites me. I hope this gets your attention because Jesus is about to demonstrate the full extent, the full extent of the greatest thing. That's that's exciting. What's wrong with you? That is that is so exciting. He's saying this thing, the greatest thing that will never pass away, let me demonstrate to you now the fullness of it. Woo! Come on, who did that? That was amazing. Yeah, woo! Do that a few more times. That's great. Woo! That's good. So you ready for it? He, verse 4, he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured a basin of, uh, we poured base, water into a basin. Then he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. The full extent of the greatest thing was the... <laughs> Put up the next picture if you wouldn't mind, please. Look at it. Here, no, look at me. I'm eclipsing it. Look at it. Look at this picture. Think about it. There's Jesus showing the full extent of his love. I thought there would have been more of him. But look where he is. What's he on? He's on the ground, mate. He's on the ground dragging around a basin full of water. He's taking his robe off and he's scrubbing his own creation's feet. He's on all fours at some point. So like I remember we've gone to India and washed the missions team's feet in India and when you do it, you, you're on the floor, you're crawling from person to person, you're dragging a bucket, you're putting their feet in the bucket, you're washing their feet, then you, dra- you dry them off, you pray for them, you drag the bucket, you crawl on all fours. Jesus would have been doing that, trust me. Crawling around on all fours, washing his disciples' feet, mate. And these are feet that have been in sandals, they're filthy, they've, they've got the, the mess of the road on them, the mess of life on them. And there's Jesus on all fours, like an ox, in the mud serving his own creation think about it please think about if this is the full extent of the greatest thing let's really think about what it really means I want you to think about the journey that that Jesus has made to get right here to right there on that floor because it's quite a long one He came from heaven. 
to earth. From perfection. Oh, could you imagine it up there? What it would have been like, what his life would have been like in heaven. <sighs> From perfection, perfect just sitting in the angels, being worshipped in perfection, being adored and being told how worthy and valuable he is and how perfect he is. <sighs> Laying that all aside and coming down to this earth, which was imperfect and broken and full of sin. Or even the fact that he came from the infinite to the finite. He's, he was in a place with no limit. There was no laws of physics There was no, you know, space and time didn't matter. He was outside of all of it. He's God. And to go from something that is completely an entity that is completely immeasurable and what we are told in Scripture is enough for our little tiny minds to just get a handle on it so God can be revealed in some way to us. But who He really is, is going to blow our minds when we really see it. He goes from immeasurable in every possible way to microscopic. See, before he got to that floor that night, the first stop when he left heaven, he became a microscopic organism in the womb of his very own creation. You know where Jesus lived for the first nine months of his mission to save mankind? In the womb of a woman. That's where God, contain- God, who is uncontainable and immeasurable, became completely measurable and small and, and constricted, confined. He did that. He was finally born and he lived his life on earth and did many great things. But then from walking around, we get to this night and he gets down on the ground. Now, hasn't he descended far enough at this stage that he maybe didn't need to do that? Hasn't he come down far enough that he maybe doesn't need to go down any further? But now he says, I want to show you the full extent of my love. And so he lowers himself to the ground. And then from that ground, he finds all those filthy feet, 24 in total. And he watches them all crawling around on all fours. From the all-powerful king of heaven to a foot washer. That is the ox. That is the servant. That's our God. Think about how crazy it must have been that the God of heaven was willing or is willing for us to identify and, co- and be compared to something as ordinary and menial as an ox. Why? For you. For you. Now, only, only one beneficiary here, and it's you. The full extent of his love is to serve you. He wants to serve you out of sin and into freedom. He wants to serve you out of your past and into a future with Him. He wants to serve you out of the out of the deficiencies and the sickness and the sorrow and whatever's gone wrong in your life. He wants to serve you out of that and into the exact opposite. And that's why He came to die on a cross, to save you from your past. And like an ox loaded with the heavy weight of sin, something you could never have ever carried yourself and that's why it was possible for God to raise us up and seat us in heavenly places with him why don't we all stand to our feet with every head bowed and and every eye closed in this place just want to ask you this with every head bowed Every eye closed. No one looking at me. I'm talking to people who don't know Jesus, who don't know this servant king, the one that was willing to liken himself as that of an ox, a burden carrier, a burden lifter. Friend, Jesus loves you so much. 
And all of us in this, all of us in this life, we have all done things that are wrong, and those things are called sin. And the problem with sin is that it separates us and robs us of being able to enjoy a relationship with the loving God that created us. But God loved us so much that He sent His Son Jesus, the servant of all, to die on a cross and carry our burden of sin to the point of death so that we wouldn't have to. You see, the consequence of sin is death for all of eternity in a horrible place separated from God. They call it hell because God's not there and that means there's no love, no joy, no peace. God never wanted you to go there. And so He sent His Son to serve your need, your great need of salvation and rescue from your sin. And if you're in this place and you've never prayed a prayer or maybe you did a long time ago and it's just fallen to the ground and seems meaningless now, I'm talking to to two types of people here today. If that's you today and you want to pray a prayer, asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins, set you free from your past so that He can carry you to a relationship with the loving God that created you. I want to pray a prayer with you from your seat and I just need you to wave, give me a wave so I know that you want to be included in that prayer. If you've never prayed a prayer, wanting to get your life right with God, just give me a quick wave if that's you. I see your hands, one, two. I see your hands, awesome, up the back. Bless you guys. We're going to pray. Is there anyone else there? Yeah, I see your hand, awesome. Anyone else on the other side? Anyone else want to get their life right with God this morning? Want to let the ox lift the burden of sin and give them a free, a, the freedom to enjoy a relationship with God? Just give me a wave. That's it, all right, for those three people. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I've got, guys, if you stuck your hand up, I just want you to pray this prayer and mean it from your heart to God. Just to have a sincere moment with God. And everyone else is going to pray really loudly to encourage you. Okay, repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you so much for dying on the cross and paying the price for my sin. I have sinned and I am sorry. Please forgive me. Please set me free and raise me up to enjoy a wonderful new life seated in heavenly places. In Jesus' name, amen. Give these people a great big cheer. (laughs) Folks, if you don't have a Bible, we have a desk up the back that says, I have decided. It's got a Bible. It's got a study. Go say hi to the people up the back if you have any more questions. But for all of us, I just want to give us this one last opportunity. We're finishing so early. We've talked about the ox, the servant. Everyone said they're grateful for the ox. But why don't we, you know, we're talking about the faces of God. And, and there's actually nothing more intimate and more, intimate and more intimacy building than actually just taking a moment to stare in someone's face. Psychologists tell you all sorts of crazy things start to happen because it's really quite powerful. I'm not really interested in what psychologists have got to say about this at the moment, but what, what I do think is really interesting is that we have this opportunity to stare into the face of our loving Saviour Jesus, the ox, the servant. So with your eyes closed, I just want to lead you in a prayer and then we're just going to sing a song of, of gratitude to Him. But maybe... Just imagine, you can look, imagine an ox, you can imagine Jesus, you can imagine Jim Caviezel Jesus, or you can imagine the chosen Jesus. It doesn't matter who you imagine. Your mind is your playground. But just imagine whatever you think Jesus looks like and look in His face. Holy Spirit, we invite you into this moment. And we just ask you to begin ministering to us. But we... We want to see your face, Jesus. We thank you for the willingness you have to actually serve us even when we don't deserve it. He's the ox. He's the burden carrier. He's the burden lifter. Friend, if you're burdened in this place while you're looking face to face with him, why don't you hand your burdens off to him? We let go of the sickness. We let go of the sorrow. We let go of the pain. We let go of the past issues. We roll the burdens onto you. 
We let go of our current worries. We let go of our financial fears. We let go of our fears surrounding family. We let go of our burdens, the things that we are carrying. We thank you that your word says we can roll them off onto you, the oxen, the servant. And as we do that, I pray that you would move in our lives and you would bring the answers. But God, never, please help us to resist the temptation to think that we could solve the problems that we just gave to you. When we try to pick them back up and try to fix them because we're tired of your timing and we're tired of how slow maybe the ox moves with the burden. I ask that by your grace and in your strength, you would give us the power to not pick up the burdens we just gave you. But instead, in those moments, you would flood us with peace to know and trust that you are the servant. You're the one that got down on the ground. You're the one that was down on his knees willing to wash feet, that you are the one that has shown the full extent of your love, that the distance that you traveled to be in front of us right now, receiving our burdens, is so great that we can know with absolute certainty that you love us and you love us fully. We're so grateful for who you are. You are so worthy of our praise. And as we worship you in this moment, I pray for every person here that they would, you, you would, they would encounter you in a fresh and powerful new way in Jesus' name. Come on, let's tell him and sing that he is worthy of it all.